Tonight's topic is about cruelty, indifference, and sensitivity. Cruelty, indifference, or apathy, and the opposite of this, which is sensitivity, or the sensitivity for others. We're not talking here about individuals who have a sensitive nature, but uh, about the midah of caring for others, of being sensitive for others. So before I begin, I just want to give you a small introduction about certain concepts that we've uh, covered directly and indirectly over the past few months in, in covering the series about the Midot characteristics. We've covered about 26 characteristics. And for those of you who have been here part of the time, uh, you may have uh, been a little bit confused as to what is exactly a characteristic. What is a Midah? When we speak about characteristics, we're talking about Tchunot nefesh, as we call them in Hebrew, human nature as he is from birth. There are certain Midot or Tchunot nefesh characteristics that one has from when the time he is born. They may not be fully developed, they're not completely mature, but the rabbis tell us that you can identify some of them in children early on. They are there, they're always there, they're present. They don't always come out, they don't always surface, because not all of life's circumstances appear to a child. It is only through life's challenges that people become exposed, that we really get to know people, what they are. These midot are therefore embedded in the human nature from the very beginning. There are some midot, however, that I would like to call them or characterize them as consequential midot. Consequential midot are not the parent midah, the parent characteristic, but it is as a result of other midot that are there. They, are, they act as the roots and the combination of them produce a subsequent or a consequential midah, a, a type of behavior in an individual. Let me give you an example. We spoke about chaos, we spoke about anger. And tonight we'll be speaking about cruelty. We spoke about strictness, kaftanut. The combination, if we were to combine these three in one individual, he is angry, or he's a temperamental person, he has a certain degree of cruelty in himself, he's very strict. What do you think the combination of these three will produce in an individual? <coughs> it will produce nakmanut, vengeance. In other words, for someone to be vengeful, to carry out an act of vengeance, to take revenge, it has to be that there are other midot there present that in their combination, this is what it will produce, unless we, of course, take control over them. Nakmanut, therefore, is not a midah in itself. It has a parent. There are roots there that produce these consequential midot. Now let's take a look at another example. Let's say you take someone who is selfish. We spoke about selfishness. You add a little bit to that selfishness, perhaps you add jealousy, kin'ah. And there may be others that we need to think about, that the combination of these may produce somebody who is abusive of others, somebody who is controlling over others. So you see, this is an example, not of a midah, somebody who is controlling in his nature, somebody who is abusive of others. That is not a midah per se, it is the result of other midot that he has that are producing this kind of behavior. Then there is, of course, conduct, how people conduct themselves in life. Are they grateful or are they ungrateful? As we call them in Hebrew, fuyetova, or they have hakaratatov. Hakaratatov or kfuyetova, gratefulness and ungratefulness, are not midot. There are forms of conduct, how people relate to others, how they conduct themselves with others, 
And of course, depending on their education, their upbringing, and their midot, they will help or encourage certain kinds of conduct. Just wanted you to have more or less an idea of what we're talking about, the differences between the terms. We're covering midot, the actual midot, the actual root of the problem. And, and this is, of course, the most important part of it, because once we understand what the root is, we can deal with it. Instead of putting a band-aid on the top of a problem, it is best, always best to go to the root of the problem. That is what midot are all about. The study of midot is a, is a study of a lifetime. We never finish studying because it is part of our nature. We cannot eradicate it completely. It's there to stay. So what is left to us to do is to take control over it. Not to let it control us, but to rein it in, to refine it, to form second habits, or habits actually which are second, a second nature. And in thus doing, we're able to quiet down that midah. We're, by having the right outlook towards life, by seeing things positively in the right light, we're able to behave very, very differently than we would otherwise. Had we not had the knowledge, had we not uh, taken steps to work on ourselves, then we would be in a raw state. A human being, when he's born, he's in a raw state. And it is up to him through his free will to develop himself, to perfect himself. That is why in the creation of, of man, it does not say that he is good. And everything else in the creation, God says, I created this and it's good. What is he telling us when something is good? Obviously it's good. There's a big difference between what is good for me and what is good for you. What is good for you may not be good for me because good is relative. When God says something is good, it means it's perfect. And it serves a purpose. It serves the purpose of creation, the tahliti. The shalem, it is complete. It is not lacking anything. Everything that God made in the world, therefore, is perfect and it's necessary, even cockroaches. There's a need for everything, and everything serves some purpose. Man is not perfect. That is why the word good is not used for him upon creation. It is up to him to make of himself a good person, one who contributes to creation, one who fulfills his mission. That's up to him. That's where free will comes in. The rest of the world does not have free will, so it is therefore created in its perfect state. It is ready to serve, ready to contribute in the best way possible. Man can be an angel or can be a demon, right? A devil. He can be wicked. He has the ability to be complete opposite of what God intended him to be. That is the, where the free will is, is, is all about. So the great difference will be in the midot, what he does with his midot, and of course, if he performs, if he observes the commandments, whether it's the 613 commandments for the Jewish nation, or whether it's the seven Noahide laws, that will determine if he succeeded in life or if he failed. So tonight we're speaking about the midah of cruelty, achzariut. Now even though I, I said before achzariut, I also said adishut and I said regishut. We're, go, we're going to talk a little bit about indifference because indifference is related to cruelty. And we're going to speak about the opposite of, of achzariut or the tikkun on how to repair or how to deal properly with cruelty and that is sensitivity. So we're going to begin with cruelty and then we're going to go on to the other ones. This particular midah, achzariut, is really the opposite of rahmanut, the opposite of compassion. And we spoke about what compassion is all about. And what's interesting is that this midah is really a midah that does not belong to the Jewish nation. The rabbis tell us that the Jewish nation has three characteristics that define them. And they are by Shanut Rahmanut Gumle Hasadim. We are a bashful people, right? We are compassionate and we are generous and kind. Therefore, if you ever meet a Jew who's lacking in his entirety one of these three, you may rightly suspect that maybe he has non-Jewish blood running through his veins. Because it is almost impossible that a Jew should lack in its entirety. I said in its entirety, completely. No figment, no nothing, no trace of one of these three midot. If there's nothing there, no Rahmanut whatsoever, then you may suspect that this is not a Jewish soul. 
Now, if you want examples of something that comes close to it, even though we are not here to judge anybody, just a little bit of a, of a taste of what it is to be cruel, or what it is not to have sensitivity towards another Jew. And that is the, the example of the Kapos in World War II. There were Jews, Jews who were willing for a little bit of cocoa and butter or margarine, whatever it is that the Nazis were going to give them, they were willing to uh, snitch and to give over another Jew to the Germans. They were willing to betray their own brothers just for a little bit more food, just for some promise that would never come true anyway because that many of them eventually were killed too. The, the, the willingness, the ability to hand over another Jew, to be that cruel and, and, and no compassion whatsoever, that is suspect. That is not something that any, every Jew is capable of doing. The majority of the Jewish people in the world are not capable of doing that. It would take a lot more to bribe him than just a little bit of cocoa and just a better breakfast. It would take a lot more to bribe someone. And even then, Jews are commanded to give their life in certain situations and not to hurt someone else. So when you see something like that, you ask yourself, where did this guy come from? And the Kabbalah gets into it a little bit more. The Kabbalah does say that among the Jewish people today, we do have people who belong to the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav are those mixtures of people who, who joined the bandwagon when we left Egypt. And because they joined the Jewish people, their souls are part of the Jewish nation today. But these souls are not the same souls as the rest of the Jewish nation. They're not as divine. They're not from Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And you can see it in their behavior. You can sometimes detect it, who these people are. And some of them may be religious. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with the type of soul. So when we talk about a midah like cruelty, in reality, it should not be amongst us. But it does exist in various levels. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist at all. It does exist in various levels, and we have to identify it. Because if it's there, we need to know what to do, how to do battle with it. So this midah, the rabbis tell us, is the opposite of compassion. And it really is to be found with those who are azepanim. Individuals who are azepanim are individuals who have no respect for others. Bezat Hashem, we'll be talking about this midah called azut, either next week or in two weeks from now. Azut really means audacity. And to be audacious can sometimes be very helpful. It is actually a good midah. But sometimes it's not a good midah because audacity is a form of chutzpah. So the rabbis tell us, this midah of achzariyut you will find amongst those who are azepanim, who have no respect for others. So that's already giving us an idea of where this midah is to be found amongst those who have no respect for others. Now, why don't they have respect for others? Well, that's what, that's what we're going to... We're going to find out. But that already tells us something. Somebody who's disrespectful, has no respect for other people, he may be a cruel man. He may have cruelty in him. And rabbis tell us more than that, that those individuals who are cruel lack a very important additional midah that they should have, and that is gemilut chasadim. Because it's, it's not compatible. They cannot be kind and generous. Those who are cruel, therefore you know that they are not as charitable, they're not as kind and generous, because the two are opposites. So we can narrow down this individual, in figuring out what he's all about, by just seeing this one midah. If a person is not kind or generous, it doesn't mean he's cruel. He could be stingy, he could be uh, selfish, not necessarily cruel. But if somebody is cruel, if you know that, you've identified that he's a cruel, he's capable of being cruel, then he, you know that he does not have Gemilut Chasadim. And since he does not have Gemilut Chasadim, we know now what it will take for him to, be, to, to get rid of his cruelty. I also saw someone say that the opposite of love is indifference. Just like the opposite of achzariyut is rahmanut, the opposite of cruelty is compassion, the opposite of love is indifference. Love means to care about someone. Therefore, the not caring about someone, to be indifferent or to have apathy, to be apathetic about someone or something, 
is a lack of love or the opposite of love. Now Mishlei brings us a very interesting pasuk. He says like this, Gomel nafsho ish hased, ve'ocher she'ero achzari. There's two meanings or two interpretations to this pasuk. Gomel nafsho ish hased means the one who does goodness with himself. He takes care of his body, of his physical well-being. He's a ish hased, he's a kind man. That is one meaning of the words gomel nafsho. The other meaning is gomel nafsho, who is nafsho, not himself, but his relatives. One who is kind and sensitive and caring of his own close relatives. He's a ish hased, that's a very kind man, he's a very generous man. It, it is ex- because it is expected of him. And the opposite, ocher she'ero achzari, one who mistreats, who is not kind, who is not respectful, who is ocher, his she'ero, his relatives, he is a cruel man, he is achzari. So Solomon, Shlomo Melech in is giving us already a little bit of an idea of who is a cruel man. If he is cruel with his own relatives, those that he is closest to, if he does not care for those who he should care a lot more, well, what is that if not cruelty? If somebody does not go out of his way for others, well, maybe we don't know yet why. Maybe he has some reason for it. But for his own relatives, where it is expected of him to be more caring, and he's not, this is an example of a cruel man. There was a, an incident where a rabbi once visited a very wealthy donor. Even though he was wealthy and he was a donor, he never gave as much as, that he, as he really could. You know, a lot of people are charitable, they give, but they could give a lot more. And that was the case with this individual. And the rabbi gets into a discussion with him about his plans to make a dormitory for the students of the yeshiva, that they should have three meals a day, that they should be comfortable so that they should be happy in the yeshiva. And uh, this wealthy donor tells the rabbi, Rabbi, I think you're wasting too much money in, on the meals and the dormitory. Look at me. You know, I eat very simple food. I eat sardines with crackers for dinner. Says the rabbi tells him, you're making a big mistake. You should have steak every night. You should have stuffed chicken and you should have uh, Cornish hen. All the good food, he tells him. Me? I should have all these good foods? Rabbi, you're telling me to, to eat and to enjoy? He says, that's not, that's not what life is all about. He says, no, you have to eat good food. Because if, if you're going to eat good food, then you're going to understand that others have to eat well too. But if you only going to eat sardines and simple crackers and no bread, if you're going to deprive yourself of all the good food, then you're not going to have that sensitivity and understanding that others need to eat well too. You're going to say, if this is good enough for me, it is good enough for them. So it's not fair. You eat well, so you should understand that others need to eat well as well, you know, just as much. Another similar story with a rabbi who came to collect funds. This time it was for a widow who didn't have any firewood for the winter. It's very cold, Eastern Europe. So he knocks on the door of this wealthy man. The wealthy man opens up the door. Oh, Rabbi, how are you? you know, what brings you here? He says, please come out and I, I need to discuss something with you, urgent. But Rabbi, it's cold, why don't you come inside? It's cozy, the fireplace is burning. No, 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 I want, you to, I want to talk to you outside. He's trying to convince him to go in. Rabbi says, no, I want you to come outside. Finally, the wealthy man comes outside, it's freezing cold, and the rabbi starts telling him the story about this widow in town who doesn't have any firewood, how they're suffering, how it's so cold and there's no heat. He says, Rabbi, fine, I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you, but please come inside. He says, now that you've heard the story, I'm going to come inside. He comes inside, they sit down at a comfortable couch next to the fire, fireplace. He says, Rabbi, why did you make me stay outside? You could have told me this story. I wanted you to feel on your own skin what the widow is going through and her children. Very simple. So how do I impress upon you? I made you come out. Otherwise you would think, ah, they don't need that much. It's okay, it's not so cold. In order for you to feel how, how cold it is and what they're going through, you have to come outside and experience it yourself. 
So that's, that's what happens sometimes, even though relatives, relatives, they're very close. They should feel. They, they should want to help. They should care. If they don't, they're cruel. There's something wrong with it. Anybody who has this midah of cruelty, it will not be possible for him to really empathize or, or understand the pain of other people. He does not have empathy. Empathy is another midah that we spoke about in the past that is similar to rahmanut. Rahmanut means pity and compassion, but empathy is a little bit different. Lachmol, we call it in Hebrew, and that is to empathize with someone in his situation, to identify with it. His problem is our problem. It's a, it's a little bit different, a different twist, and it's a very, very special midah. People sometimes have compassion, and they give charity. That's easy. You know what empathy is? You take time off, and you sit down, and you talk about the person's problem. You identify with it. You sit down, you, you discuss ways to help him. You're not just having pity for him and just giving him a check. You're empathizing with him. You're identifying with him. You're, you're making a much stronger connection with him. So an individual who is cruel will be lacking all of this. It will not be possible for him to identify with other people's struggles. Not at all whatsoever. And because of that, because he does not empathize with other people's troubles, he is also closer to becoming a vengeful person. If he ever gets upset, if he ever bears a grudge against someone, remember, he does not identify with the pain of others. All you need is a little bit to, to anger him, and he can become vengeful. And this type of attitude that he will have will eventually lead him to machloket, arguments, hatred, fights, all kinds of issues that will come up in life because of a lack of empathy for other people's sarot, other people's problems. That is why the Torah, in trying to help the Jew have the right character, gives us various mitzvot and advice. And one of them is, <laughs> when it comes to your closest relatives, be careful not to ignore them. It is easy to ignore. I don't know about it. I didn't look into it. I, they, nobody called me. So therefore, I didn't look into it. Just because nobody called you about somebody's problem doesn't mean that you shouldn't be active, proactive, in trying to figure out what you can do to help. It's very easy, especially if nobody calls you or sends you a letter, to just say, well, I, I didn't know about it. So therefore, the Torah has to warn us, when it comes to those who are closest to you, you have a greater responsibility. Look into it. See what it is that you can do. This is about close relatives. Then there's another group where the Torah tells us, be extra sensitive with them. Oiva, boy, if you're not. And who are they? The poor, the widows, and the orphans. And let the community take care of them. Let somebody else do it. On that, the Torah tells us, be careful because Hashem Yarivet Rivam. If you're unsensitive to them, God, who's, who's, going to want, who's going to be the one that takes care of them, he will fight for them. And there was an incredible story that happened about uh, 100 years ago, give or take, in Eastern Europe, where there was a landlord that uh, rented out his place to a, a widow and her orphans. And uh, she stopped paying. She couldn't pay anymore, the rent. So he warned her that if she didn't pay, he would kick her out. So the community came to this landlord, this wealthy landlord, and they said, listen, give us a chance. Maybe we can put together some money for her. And maybe they put together some money for one month or two months. After that, they couldn't pay. They, they just couldn't go on. And what did he do? He, of course, did not just bang the door down and remove them. He didn't evict them. He took off the roof, and because he took off the roof, it was winter, so it rained, it snowed in, and in this way he compelled them, he forced them indirectly to move out. You know, to him that was easier than just having somebody evict them. So when they came to the Chafetz Chaim, and they told him, look what this man did, the Chafetz Chaim said, 
I have no doubt whatsoever that one of these days he's going to be punished for this, for this terrible act of cruelty and lack of sensitivity to a widow. I'm sure he could have found a way to arrange for her to pay in installments and somehow because he didn't do that and he forced her to leave and forced her to go through this terrible experience with the snow and the rain, he's going he's gonna to be punished. Years went by, nothing happened to him. He continued to be a successful man. And they came to the rabbi. Again, rabbi, you said that something was going to happen to him. Nothing ever happened to him. He says, don't worry. It doesn't have to happen the next day. I can guarantee you, I will assure you, that one of these days you will see it for yourself. And sure enough, it was about 25 years later. There was a plague in town, in Magifa. People died. This wealthy man died in the plague. What was different about him is that he died in the middle of the street. You know, most other people, they died in their bed, they died in the hospital, right? He died in the middle of the street. Now, because it was a plague, nobody wanted to touch him. It's contagious. So the Hevra Kadisha didn't come by to bury him. Nobody took him from the street. He was there in the street, and guess what happened to him? It rained on him, and it snowed on him. Exactly what he did to the widow and the orphans. We're talking a couple, about a couple weeks went by, and the body is rotting in the street. His older, elderly father, who was already in his 80s, had no choice but to drag his son from the street to go bury him himself. Nobody wanted to take care of him. Nobody wanted to bury him. What is this? Everything is minashamayim. Everything is from heaven. Everything is midah keneged midah. An eye for an eye, measure for measure. One has to be extremely extra careful with widows and orphans and with the poor because Hashem takes direct responsibility for them. And the same is with a convert, with anyone who's, who's unfamiliar with the system and it is easy for people to take advantage of him. The Torah says, Ger lo Be careful not to oppress the, 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 the ger, the convert. Be careful not to cheat him, not to mislead him. He is naive. But people may take advantage. So anytime there's someone who has a weak side to him, the Torah tells us to be extra careful because you may be tempted to ignore them or to abuse them. The Torah says be extra careful with them because he is listening and he will do something about it. Can I share a story with Chazonish? Another story with the Chazonish? Yes, what was the story? The story was there was this person that was living in an area that he couldn't afford... Uh, he paid the rent, but it was very low rent, and so right. the landlord saw that this neighborhood is already improving, and, and the, he can't uh, have to live here. So uh, he went to Chazonish and asked Chazonish what he should do. Right. Chazonish said, the man has the right to rent it to someone else because it's a much better neighborhood, he can get more money for it, uh, but if worse comes to worse, you go live in the, uh, in, in the field, in the park. And do that. And if you do that, I promise you that you're going to marry off all of your children and they're all going to have houses. And that was right. the kind Because he says, the man is right. He has a right to get an increase in rent. Right. But you have to do what has to be done. So here's like a reverse case. where if, In other words, he was out. telling him, if he forgoes on that. Right. And he moved out and they lived in the park or the field. And he was zoiche to be able to marry off all his children. Able to buy all houses. Yeah, the one who moved out was the one that was living there? Yeah. Yeah. The Chazonish told him. If you do, yeah. if you were to move out, you have to have the talk from Hashem that this Then is you the have way. to trust that Hashem will help you. Right. Yeah. And, and he not only not only helped him, he, he received a great blessing. Right. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Another another commandment that Torah tells us Lotonu Ishit Amito. Lotonu Ishit Amito, there's two kinds of onaa. Onaa means to cheat. And it also means verbal abuse. Two kinds of onah. Onaat mamon and onaat devarim. To, to cheat monetarily, we know is wrong. There are various kinds of various forms of cheating. That is a combination of both lying and stealing from people. But there's something called onaat devarim. The Torah tells us be also careful with verbal abuse, not to make fun of people, not to laugh at them, especially at those who are who are weak, the weak of, of society, whether they are poor or generally weak. So be careful not to cause them any, any pain. 
Rabbi tells us, Kol HaSha'arim Nin'alim Chutz Mishare Ona'a All the gates in heaven are closed. In other words, if we try to pray and communicate, sometimes they don't open up the gates for us. But the gates of those who have been cheated, those who have been pained by others, the gates are always open to hear their cries. <coughs> so be very careful if you cause, if you inflict pain on someone, and he cries out to God, God will listen. The gates are always open to hearing the pain of those who have been, who have, uh, been victimized. Another area that one has to be careful with is Otsat Shemra, giving somebody a bad reputation. That causes, may cause him tremendous amount of shame and pain. Another area where the Torah tells us to be very careful is if somebody owes you money, loti yelo kenoshe, don't go bothering him every other day for the money if you know he has no money. If you know he has money, go ahead and bother him. Do whatever you can. Yeah, unfortunately, some people take advantage. They borrow your money and then they spend it on all kinds of things that they don't really need to. They shouldn't. And uh, then they don't have. We're not talking about those people who take advantage. There are individuals who have, you know, come to hard times and sometimes need a loan. And one has to be patient with them. Loti yelo kenoshe, therefore the Torah tells us, be sensitive to that individual who borrowed the money. He cannot give you back the money right away. He doesn't have it. The Chafetz Chaim used to be very careful. He, during the time that he had a small store, a business, people who used to buy in credit would not always pay up right away. He was always careful not to walk by their home. So they shouldn't even think that he's coming to knock on the door to collect the money. That is how sensitive he was towards people's feelings. I, he didn't want them to even think that he's coming to ask them for the loan back. So these are, there are situations where we have to be extra sensitive. Another area where one has to be sensitive is lotir debo befarech. You have servants, you have uh, workers. Don't abuse them. Don't make them work harder than what they need to. Extra hours without paying them. If you have a position of power, you're an authority. Doesn't mean that you should abuse that position and demand of people to do things that are very difficult. These are all areas and examples of where one needs to be sensitive, where it can easily get carried away. Another area is animal cruelty. We're talking about cruelty, and that is a big topic amongst the non-Jewish world too. Animal cruelty. Be very careful with not showing any cruelty towards animals. Even the shahita, when we slaughter animals, is done in such a very sensitive way, just to avoid any excess cruelty, any pain, excess pain, I should say, towards the animal. And here you have, you know, all over the world, people who make of it a sport and uh, just go on and do all kinds of things to animals, which is Tsar Balechaim, as it's called by the Rambas. Tsar Balechaim is a prohibition from the Torah. You cannot inflict pain on an animal just for, for the fun of it. If you see an, a donkey, that's a famous example in the Torah, you see a donkey of your enemy who's overloaded and it's in pain, you have to help unload the cargo. It's not so much for your friend, it's for the animal, that he should not have the pain that he's having. Rabbis tell us that anyone who is cruel, anyone who behaves in a very cruel way, people will not like him, people will despise him. And in, in, in other ways, this is what the rabbis tell us, it is your deeds that will bring about people to get closer to you or people to be distant from you, depending on how you behave. So if people behave in a cruel way, people who are unsensitive toward others, people know these things. You can't hide these things. So the, the immediate result of this is similar to what we said last week, to the one who's selfish, it leads an individual to a life of no friends, a solitary life. One more thing before we go into the tikkun and how to deal with this uh, characteristic, I found in the Zohar something incredible. The Zohar says that anybody who was cruel on a particular day towards someone, he did something in a very, very unsensitive way, that day will remain cursed for the rest of his life. 
And that day will one day in the future be cruel towards him. That day will become achzar. It will be a, a cruel day. And somehow, some point in the future, it will come back to haunt him. So th- these, these acts, these deeds are recorded. And some of them are, can be very, very uh, painful in the future. We may not be able to connect them, but up, upstairs they don't forget anything. So for whatever we do, we have to rem- remember that if, that if we don't correct it in time, it may come back later on and get back at us. There are two examples, or, or perhaps a few more examples, of where one should be cruel. And I'm not talking about just being cruel with Rashaim, with the wicked. I'm not talking about Amalek. You should be cruel with yourself. In other words, if, if one needs to perform a mitzvah, one needs to get up early in the morning or go to a class and he's having problems because he's lazy, he's tired, he, he sometimes may have to force himself. So cruelty in this case would be to deprive yourself of having your meal, dinner, but go and do the mitzvah. Because if you don't deprive yourself sometimes, you may not accomplish it. So sometimes it, it is okay to be cruel to yourself if it is lichboshet ha if it is to overcome the evil inclination. As long as you don't overdo it. There are people who overdo it. They're very cruel to themselves and they don't eat at all. Uh, I think it's called in English anorexia. Is that what it is? That they don't eat at all? They want to be skinny like a stick? Is that what it is, anorexia? That's no good. Huh? You don't have to be a size minus one. Be a size two or three. I mean, if, you know, right? So what is this? I mean, it's all in the head. It's all in the head, obviously. They think they're okay. They think they're okay, but it's not okay. You have to be careful. You have to take care of the body. Remember the pasuk we said early, Gobel nafsho ish chasid. You're kind if you take care of your body. Your body is a vessel for Hashem. It's a vessel where the soul resides during its lifetime. You, if you smoke and you drink and you do all these things, terrible things to the body, you're killing yourself. And you may not last as long as you could have otherwise. When you come upstairs and you... What are you doing here, they're going to ask. You should have been down there for another 40 years. You're too early. Right? Well, people kill themselves. That's no good. But if it, the cruelty is to get yourself to do a mitzvah, then that's fine. Another area where it's, where it's correct to be cruel or not too sympathetic or sensitive is when you are in court and you are the judge. You're not allowed to have any rahmanut in justice. You are asked, you are instructed to be just, to do the right thing, to do what the Allah says, what the Torah says. It has nothing to do with the fact that he is poor and he is rich. I'm going to make the poor man win the case. Chas v'shalom. Tzedek tzedek tirdof. You have to be just. You have to be fair. You have to do the right things. So you cannot have Rahmanut Badin when it comes to justice. So there are a few examples where you don't want to misuse the, uh, the compassion, where you need to be cruel. This cruelty, as I, started, as I mentioned earlier, is really a form of apathy. Apathy, or as it is called, indifference, is very unique in, in this case of cruelty because we're talking about an apathy or indifference to pain, to other people's pain, that is. And sometimes there are people who actually enjoy inflicting pain on, on others. So it's one thing for a person to be indifferent towards other people's pain, which makes him cruel. It is another level, or worse, when he actually enjoys inflicting pain to others, seeing other people miserable. You may have met people like that. And guess what? The Torah is aware of that too. And that is why the Torah tells us, Bin fol o al tismach. Even when you see your enemy falling, don't rejoice. Why is the Torah telling us this? Now, there are various reasons why the Torah warns us to be careful not to rejoice. This is not a time to rejoice. We have to be happy that we are safe, not that they have, they have been destroyed. That is the way we should look at it. Baruch Hashem, Hashem saved us. Not great that they are destroyed and finished. So, bin follow your father, this the Torah is telling us, be careful not to have that kind of an attitude to enjoy when other people are being destroyed. Other human beings. These are creations of Hashem too. What's this for? It's to develop sensitivity toward others. They're, they're humans. They're creations of God. 
So with this commandment, with this instruction, the Torah is basically telling us this is what you should be working on. On being caring and being sensitive and not happy with the downfall of others. Also the Torah tells us that even if somebody harmed you, loti kom veloti tor, don't take revenge. What's the difference between loti kom veloti tor? One is nekama, revenge, loti kom. The other one is loti tor. Loti tor means don't bear a grudge. What's the example of bearing a grudge? Let's say Reuven and Shimon. Reuven comes to Shimon, knocks on his door. Can you lend me your hammer? He says, no, I don't want to lend you my hammer. I'm upset at you or whatever. I don't want to give you a hammer. Or he tells him, I don't have it. Whatever. All right. Shimon comes the other day, the next day to Reuven. and says, you know what? My car broke down. Can you lend me your car for half an hour? I need to go get something. No, I'm not giving you my car because you didn't give me the other day a hammer. When I asked you for something, you didn't give me what I needed. So I'm not going to give you what. That's nekama. That's a form of revenge. What's lotitor? Shimon comes to Reuven and Reuven tells Shimon, yeah, take my car. I'm not like you. <laughs> the fact that he tells him those words, I'm not like you, he has something against him still. He still bears, that's called bearing a grudge. That's netira. Netira is in the heart, netira is in the makshava, in the thought. The Torah doesn't want us to have any bad thoughts towards someone. And there, there's, there's stories, I think the story was with uh, the Briska Rav, the Rav of Brisk, I think when he was once in an inn. The, the owner of the inn did not know who he was and was very disrespectful of him. He made a sleep in the staircase, did not give him a meal. It was cold until one of the rabbis that came in later met him on the staircase and, and got all excited. What are you doing here? So finally the, the owner of the place realized his mistake and he begged him forgiveness. So the rabbi says, I will forgive you. That's okay, but I will not forgive you completely until you come to my house and you learn what it is to have guests and how to treat people. In other words, what did he want to do over here? He wanted not only to teach this man how to treat others, but he also wanted to make sure he has nothing against him. So by inviting him and by taking care of him, he would make sure he has nothing in him against that individual. And there was a similar story with Rabbi Salah Salanta, who on, on the train, there was a guy who was nagging all the time. Open the window. He opened the window. Then he told him, close the window, it's cold. Then he started smoking himself and he tells the rabbi, don't you see? It's stuffy here, open the window. And he was, the, he, he was giving this rabbi, he didn't know who the rabbi was. He was giving him a hard time throughout the whole train ride. Finally, the train arrives at the destination and, and you can imagine all the people coming to greet the big rabbi. And now he finds out that this is the great rabbi here. He felt terrible. So he asked him forgiveness. The rabbi says, I forgive you, don't worry. But you got to tell me what you're here for. He says, I came here to to get a semicha for shochet. He wants to be a shochet. In order to be a shochet, you got to get semicha. you got to get the rabbi's approval, you have to be tested. So Rabbi Yisrael Salanta set him up where to sleep, set him up a place where he could learn, set him up a place where he can be, where he can, be, where he can receive the exam and get the semicha. People asked him, you're going out of your way for somebody who gave you such a hard time in the train ride? He says, yes, I want to make sure I don't have anything whatsoever against him. So I'm doing something for him even though I don't owe it to him so much. I can just say, I'm so, okay, I forgive you. Ani No, that's not enough. I want to make sure I have no netira. I don't have a grudge against you whatsoever. So therefore, I'm going out of my way to do for you. These are people who were sensitive, who wanted to make sure that there was nothing in them left over that they were still upset about uh, the individual. Yes? Okay. איך שאתה רוצה, אני אתרגם את זה. יש את הדברים, יש גם את השילוח, כן, שזה גם אחרי שהקדוש ברוך הוא רשב בתורה. נכון, יש הרבה מצוות בתורה, שמה שהם יש להם בתורה, זה שהם עדיין נשאר את זה רחמנות. שילוח הכן זה לא בדיוק הכי טוב. לשלוח את המדע ברד זה הפוך, זה אכזרי. אם אין דבר, זה שקרו. נכון? What ha rabbis tell us, be careful not to interpret Shiluah HaKen as Rachmanut of Hashem. They said, because it's not. It's a decree. 
But not only do the rabbis tell us, it doesn't make sense that it should be completely Rachmanut. Shiluah HaKen is sending out the mother bird, what's involved in the mitzvah? The Torah tells us, don't take the cheeks while the mother is there, send out the mother bird, and then t- take the cheeks or the eggs for yourself. Later on, you can put them back if you don't want the eggs. I mean, you don't have to. But that's the mitzvah. The mitzvah is send off the mother bird and then take the baby chicks. So I'm, I want to ask you something. Is that rahmanut or is that achzaru? Is that compassion, pity, or cruelty? It's both. If you want to look at it fairly, it has both elements. It is rahmanut in some ways because the Torah doesn't want us to take the cheeks while the mother is there. If you ever try to do that, you will find, if it's a pigeon, that she flaps her wings very strongly if she feels that you're bothering her nest. And let be- she has no choice, she leaves. So on the one hand, Torah says, don't do that. Don't take her, don't take the chicks or the eggs while she's there. First send her off, then take it. So that's a form of Rahmanut. On the other hand, by sending off the mother, you're, you're being cruel too. You're sending off a mother from her. And of course, Kabbalistically, this whole idea of sending off the mother is supposed to be me'orei rachamim b'shamayim and am Israel, that Hashem should have pity on us, just like the mother bird on, from a distance feels bad for her kids, for her chicks. We are awakening the pity, not down here, but b'shamayim over us. So this mitzvah is not the best example, but it does contain elements of rachmanut in it. Anyway, so we were talking about netira, not to, not to have a grudge, you want, we, got, we want to get this completely out of our system. Uh, can I ask Yeah. I heard one in a, in a class that, uh, about your husband, and the children, they look like, uh, it is, they act like if they use a cruelty and so, they act sadistically and try to play with the bird and, and they so with okay. swallowing them yeah. and down and so. Yeah. It's very hard subject really to teach. Yeah, sure. Yeah, some mitzvot are called chukim. They're decrees. We don't understand them logically. Yeah. But there's still some reason behind them. Yeah. These midot, the terrible midot that sometimes pop up, our responsibility is to not allow them to make roots. In other words, someone may have a particular midah, a particular characteristic. Our responsibility is Make sure that it does not make roots, that it does not stay with you. Uh, if anything, work or be active in removing it. What I mean by making roots is because sometimes through life, all kinds of situations happen that tempt us to react. We are reacting instead of acting on our own. What's the difference between acting on our own and reacting? People, when people react to a situation, they may not be reacting properly, depending on what kind of, uh, of midot they have. If they're temperamental, they get angry, they get upset, they take revenge, they're going to do something destructive. So if we want to have complete control over ourselves, we want to make sure that these midot, whenever they surface because of challenges in life, don't make roots. In other words, don't stay settled uh, in our, in, our, in our system, otherwise, Shalom, they can come up at any, any given moment and uh, be destructive. So we always have to be proactive in ridding them ourselves of these midot. Proactive meaning doing things that will hopefully remove them or control them. And the, these are the mitzvot. When the Torah gives a certain mitzvot and hanhagot, the Torah is basically telling us, listen, this is the way some people are. Human beings have certain weaknesses. These are the things that you need to do in order to make sure that you are not like that. So we have many mitzvot, as the Sefer HaChinuch says, that by performing them, it will be through our actions that our hearts will be influenced. The more we do something, our hearts will be influenced by it. As the mitzvah of kibbut avaim is, the giving respect or honoring our parents. If we honor our parents because we're appreciative of all that they do for us, they feed us, they clothe us, this will help us with the mitzvah of Ahavat Hashem, of loving Hashem and realizing how much He does for us, how much He takes care of us. So the mitzvot have pretty much this common thread going through them. Be proactive in doing them because they, you will become a better person through them. 
Okay, so now that we've more or less covered the topic, let's talk a little bit about some tips, some ideas of how one can help himself and help others. Well, the opposite of cruelty or indifference is sensitivity for others, regishut. How do we develop sensitivity? If we really are prepared to help someone, if we really care about someone, then we have to do something for them. It is not enough that a person has feelings in his heart. If, if it's just feelings, it won't get him anywhere. Feelings have to be translated into actions. If a person develops, by, through actions, a sensitivity for others by doing things for them, he will care more about them. He will be able to help them. So step number one, someone who is cruel has to divest himself of being self-centered. We spoke a little bit about self-centeredness last week. A person who is self-centered means he's mechunas atzmo. He's into himself, into his own life. It's a little bit different than selfish. For a person to not be as cruel, he has to do the exact opposite of that, is to become more open and friendly with others, more easygoing. More open with others means that he has to be more patient with others. But how do you do that? But that's the trick. That's the, I'm, I'm giving you what needs to be done, and, and we're going to go into how to accomplish that. But the idea is he has to get out of his shell and be more involved, let's call it involvement, with others. How do we do it? Rav Shamshon, Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, Zecher Sadiq Levavah, says something very nice. He says the word rachamim, compassion, and the word rechem are the same root. Rechem in Hebrew means womb. The womb, the mother's womb where the children come from. It says compassion is like womb. If you want to develop compassion over other Jews, just think about how we're all from the same spiritual womb. We all came out from the same rechem. You see how rachamim is tied to rechem. So in order to develop this kind of rachmanut and feelings and sensitivity for others, think about the fact that we're all from the same rechem. So these kind of thoughts, hopefully, will, will follow through with actions. The same thing what the rabbi tells us in Pekeh Avot about Chaviv Adam Shinivra Betzelem. Remember how special the human being is who was created in the image of God. Every human being. Every human being is special. We're all created in the image of God. And therefore, when you see someone in the street, say hello, say good morning, how are you? Haven't you had a situation where a guy said to you out of nowhere, not knowing who you are, hi, how are you doing? Good morning. Usually they say shalom, but they see you. Too. Just, don't say, just don't say it in New York because they'll know you're not from there. <laughs> I, I once said good morning, I, can I have this? He said, oh, I can tell you're not from here. Here we don't say good morning. Yeah. So some places they're just not used to saying these things, but the, the proper way of... of, of of conducting ourselves with people is to be nice, to take attention, to, to be attentive and to realize that they are there. Otherwise, if you ignore somebody in the street on Shabbat, you don't say Shabbat Shalom to them, and they are sensitive by nature, they may think that you have something against them, especially if they know you. It's insulting to someone. Now, you may be absent-minded. You're, in, you're into your own thoughts and your own world thinking about some issue. Be careful with that, because people don't know that. People will say, well, he just, he wasn't across the street. He was next to me. He didn't even look at me. You see how these little things make a difference? It's therefore the right thing to get used to is to say hello, Shabbat Shalom if he's Jewish. Hi, good morning, how are you? These are normal things that even if we don't do them naturally, we should get used to doing them as much as possible, depending how close we are to these people, close in distance. So that, these, are, these are small steps that we can take. Another important step is to be attentive to people. Somebody has an issue, has a problem, sit down with them and listen to them. People have trouble being listeners. They don't listen enough. They want to say what's on their mind without giving the other person a chance to say what he has to say. 
So one of the tricks here, one of the, part of the strategy is to be attentive. Attentive not only to take notice of them, not only to say, how are you, but also to listen to them. Sit down, be patient, listen to what they have to say, feel for them, at least show, at least make, make believe you feel for them. In other words, let, the, let them see that you really care. Give the impression that you want to be involved in their life. For that, of course, one, one needs a lot of patience. If you don't have the patience, of course, it's not going to work. So the, all of these midot require sometimes the work on other midot. In order to be able to overcome this midah, we need to adapt the midah of sablanut of patience. Be aware that people have weaknesses. No one is perfect. This, this awareness also is very helpful. Not everybody is perfect. I mean, people have weaknesses. And therefore, if you understand this, this may help you to be more sympathetic of them. And don't think you can't help people. There are many ways you can help people. There's a story that I saw recently of a girl who was very, very sick. She had some form of cancer. And any time she would walk down the street, all her friends avoided her. And look how smart she was. She says, I know why they're avoiding me. She felt bad they were avoiding her. But she at least understood. They are, vo are avoiding her because they don't know what to say to her. They're uncomfortable coming close to her and realizing this is her predicament. So this, she was a smart girl. And what did she say? To them later on, all you have to say to make me feel good is I'm praying for you. If you have nothing better to say, find something. You feel uncomfortable by asking me how are you because obviously you know how I am. <laughs> You're not doing too well. All right, fine. Then say, say something neutral or something positive. There's so many ways you can help someone. Some, they don't know how to express themselves. Right, but that's why you have to learn these things. When you go to a mourner's house, you better be prepared to say the right thing, otherwise don't say it. There's a, there's, a, there's a famous example I like to use of somebody that went to do a mitzvah, Bikur Cholim. He went to the hospital to visit somebody who was very, very sick with leukemia. And he tells him, you know, I know somebody exactly like you who died at the age of 22. <laughs> could, you, could, you, could you understand that? Yeah. Isn't that cruelty? Lack of sensitivity and stupidity. <laughs> right? All of them together. <laughs> How could you say something like that? People come to a mourner's house. Okay, so what did he die of? <laughs> what do you mean, what did he die of? What difference does it make? The Malacha Mavit, the angel of death, came and took him. You, you got to know how he did it. What did he die of? <laughs> you know, people say stupid things. They're wrong things. You got to be sensitive. In the house of mourning, especially if this was a somebody who died not at the age of 99. At a very young age, it's even more sensitive. Yeah. Even if somebody died at 99, you know, you just can't tell him, well, he's happier now where he is. <laughs> you know, he was suffering, you know. Yeah, come on. You know. be, be, be sensitive. If, yeah. If you don't know what to say, don't say it. Yeah, but it depends if he's religious or not. He may not know what Baruch Dayana Emet is. Uh. Right? What's Baruch Dayana mean? God knows what he's doing. That, that's a, a guy who's a secular Jew, if you tell him something like that, is, you know. You have, you, it's better not to say anything. And that is what the Halakha says, by the way. When you come to a mourner's house, he has to speak first. You have no right to speak until he has first spoken himself. Let him speak. Maybe he's not in the mood of speaking. Sometimes, by an individual coming over or speaking, he's being intrusive instead of supportive. Be very careful not to be intrusive. If anything, try to be supportive in some way. Help. Is there anything I can do to help you? You know, do you need anything? That's being supportive and helpful. Be careful not to be intrusive. Anyway, these small steps, what do they do? They form a bond. In Hebrew, it's called itanyanut. The itanyanut, a person, when he shows that he wants to be involved, this creates a kesher, it creates a bond between two people. So once the bond is there, the next step will be 
לבנות אמון, to generate trust. Let him hopefully trust you. Once he trusts you, he will be able to speak to you in a different way. He will be able to express to you everything. And trust is, is a very good feeling. When people know that they're being trusted, that's, but you have to earn it. You have to bring it out. So you have to basically do something to get him to trust you. But this is the way you start forming bonds with people. And of course, there's more involvement and there's more caring. People have to be reminded that any disabilities do not make them necessarily inferior to others. Some people have this inferiority complex about themselves. So if you're in the position to reassure them, that, that would be very good. This, this would be an additional small step to, bring, to, to become more and more sensitized and, and more, more caring about somebody else by reassuring them that you're not inferior whatsoever. Now, all of these are very nice ideas, but they won't fly anywhere. They will not help an individual who's not truthful with himself. Adam Shulo Amitim Imatzmo, if he's not truthful with himself, he will never be able to have any feelings towards someone else. And that sounds a little bit strange, but it's, there's a lot of truth to that. You have to be a truthful person. And the only way you can learn to be truthful is that if you ever hurt anyone whatsoever in your life, immediately go over and apologize. You know how difficult this is for a lot of people to do? So if somebody is not cruel, he's just a very quiet person, he's just ashamed, and he doesn't say, I'm sorry, it's one thing. It's still not good. But if somebody, we're talking about an individual who's cruel, who's not sensitive, right? Who's indifferent to other people's pain. We want to get it out of him. If he's not going to say, I'm sorry, if he does not come to terms with it, he's not, it's not going to go anywhere. He is not truthful with himself. He's not truthful. How could he have feelings for others? So he's taking all these steps. He's being patient. He's listening, lending a, an ear. It, it, will not be good. it will not be enough. You have to be truthful with yourself. Because being truthful and saying I'm sorry means that you are taking responsibility for your actions. It, it, bec it becomes more serious. And Bezat Hashem, we will be talking about this mitah called seriousness, retzinut, at another time. What it means to be serious. What it means to, to, to be responsible. Always ask, can you help? Always ask if there's anything you can do to help someone. Asking that not only doesn't hurt, it helps the individual himself who's asking to, to be more sensitive. What about the difficulty taking a banter about it? No, there will, there will always be occasionally people like that. But Still to do it? And people keep taking, yeah. taking uh, a let me, let me, let, a Yes, guy, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. You go out to the door, whether it's a hospital lobby, whether it's a hotel, and you see somebody coming, and you keep the door open for them. Most people don't do this, by the way. Why? He can open the door. It's not a person in a wheelchair, which you really have to be extra cruel not to open the door for him, right? Extra cruel. But let's say you're not extra cruel, just a little cruel, <laughs> right? If the guy is coming and you keep the door open for him, this helps overcome the cruelty. We're giving here ideas on how to overcome a person who's really, really not sadistic, which is a whole different idea, but he's cruel. He's indifferent, adish. He doesn't care. He doesn't have feelings. If he opens the door for him, he's doing the kindness. Yeah. Not an act of cruelty. No, right. He's doing the opposite to overcome the cruelty. He's taking a step. To, we're talking about steps or tips to overcome the cruelty. So here he's opening, keeping the door open or asking, is there anything I can do for you? Somebody comes home with groceries and they live in the second story, third story. Why don't you offer them? You want me to keep your hand? Take the bags for them. What's the big deal? Nothing happened. It's always a good thing. It's always a chesed. It's always a mitzvah. But especially somebody who has a difficulty with cruelty, the more so that he should, if he wants to get out of it, if he wants to control it, these are ideas. Another very important idea is to f keep your promises. A promise is a promise. We were speaking before about being truthful with yourself. If you break your promises, it's going, to, it's going to be very difficult to have sensitivity or feelings for others. It just, it's incompatible. A person who breaks his promises doesn't keep them. He lacks the strength to conquer any midah. In many, he will have a hard time with many midot, a person who doesn't keep promises. Let's say you see two people who are having a fight. 
And what's the, what's the problem here? The, the reason why there is a fight is because there are people who are picking on him. You know what it is to pick on him? Hamid Garimbo. They're picking on him, making fun of him, and you take a stand and you get involved. As long as, of course, it's not dangerous, right, for you to get involved. And you try to make peace. This will help you. You can stand and not do anything. Says, why should I get involved? Of course, that's the natural thing for many people to do. But if you do get involved, if you do help, you, st- you say, no, it's not right, it's not fair, it's wrong. This will help. These are midot, these are conducts, these are things, actions, deeds that help people become more caring, more sensitive, and form a greater bond with people. We have to be involved with other people's lives in order to care for them. That's the, great, that's the beauty of chesed, the importance of chesed versus tzedakah. Tzedakah, you give an $18 check, ma'asalam, as we say in Arabic, uh, shalom, right? Hasta la vista. Atzlaha, may you be successful. Come, sit down. You want a drink? You've had a long day. Tell me what the issues are. How's your wife uh, handling this, you know, that you're away from her for so long? You're taking an interest in his life. You don't have to do that. Most people in the world, when they give you a check, they don't do all of that. Yeah. Right. They write, some of them write beautiful checks. Even a $500 check. That's very nice. But they didn't take the time to sit down. It takes a lot more of an individual to sit down to listen to him and to reassure him. And he's, he will receive a lot more blessings. For, for 11 blessings you get for speaking to a person like that. 11 blessings. And 6 prophets you get for giving stuff. That's right. Eleven for saying something nice, and six for just being charitable. What's better, right? It's harder, therefore, to take your time and to sit down and to listen, because obviously it, it, there's more effort involved. But this involvement is what will help a person develop little by little more sensitivity to others. I just like to end with a beautiful quotation that I saw about people who are sensitive and caring and how we wish we had more of them. It's a very beautiful quotation, and it it reads as follows. Someone asked me once if I could see angels and fairies. I told her, look to the sensitive, loving, caring ones who bring so much to our world and take on the suffering of others. They are the earth angels sent to earth to help us in our life journey. This world needs all the earth angels it can get. There are earth angels out there, people, beautiful people who care for others, who take on themselves their suffering, bear it with them, care for them, love them, do for them. We wish there were many more like that. Unfortunately, there are devils out there too. (laughs) People who are just exact opposite, who hurt others, who are indifferent about others, who couldn't care about others, Look at the difference between the two of them. One is an angel and one is like a devil. Well, let it be the will of Hashem that all of us will do whatever it takes to become angels with Hashem. Thank you.